All right, Alexander, let's talk about what is happening with uh, Israel and Iran. And maybe we can start things off with that Financial Times article, which talks about a calibrated response from Iran and hints at some sort of back channel diplomacy taking place that took place. That took place because the article was written about a day before uh, Iran uh, launched their, their drone and missile strikes at Israel. Uh, the back channel diplomacy that took place between the United States and Iran via Oman. That is what the Financial Times article was uh, was hinting at. And you talked about this in your video update. Uh, I saw your video update and then I read the article and I built much of my analysis based on that video update and that article from the Financial Times because that article from the Financial Times almost felt like it scripted out the entire uh, all the, the entire events that then unfolded with regards to Iran and uh, and Israel anyway so let's let's get into it what are what are your thoughts it's one of the most extraordinary articles i have ever read in the media because it, it written on the eve of an iranian missile strike on israel it basically set out in advance, pretty much everything that we've seen since. I mean, you're quite right when you say hint, because, of course, he didn't exactly prophesy, didn't say that this would happen. But it basically, if you read it carefully, it, it made it fairly clear that this is what was likely to happen. Now, I think, you know, we need to, we need to understand a number of things. The first thing is that um, the United States does not want a general war in the Middle East. When I say the United States, I have to be very careful because there are some people in the United States and there are some people, no doubt, within the administration who probably do want a general war in the Middle East, a war between the United States and Iran alongside Israel. You know, all the massive crisis, fighting, missiles going backwards and forwards, airstrikes on Iran, they, they hanker and long for that, and have done so for decades. And, you know, they're as close to getting it as they've ever been. But there are other people in the United States who say to themselves, look, we've got this ongoing crisis in Ukraine, which is going horribly wrong. We have had a crisis in Gaza, which is going horribly wrong. We have a very difficult election in the United States coming. We do not need a war in the Middle East at this time, especially as every single military venture we've attempted in the Middle East since 2000 has been a failure. And so that seems to me at the moment to be the ascendant view within the administration. And on the Iranian side, you can also see why they too don't want a war, a general war in the Middle East. From their point of view, everything up to recently has been going right for them. They've sorted out their relations with Saudi Arabia. They're, they've joined the BRICS. Their economy is booming. They've uh, co um, completed a major arms agreement, arms supply agreement with Russia. They've started um, receiving Russian uh, uh, ground attack and training aircraft, the most advanced aircraft they've received from any place basically since the fall of the Shah of Iran. They don't want to jeopardize that situation either. They know perfectly well that if they got drawn into a long, prolonged conflict, all-out conflict in the Middle East, that would create chaos and havoc for them and set them massively back. So given that these interests exist, and given that, as we've discussed in many previous programs, that missile strike by Israel on the Iranian embassy in Damascus was clearly intended as a trap, a trap to get the United States and Iran ultimately fighting each other. It's not surprising, given the joint interests that each side has to avoid falling into that trap, that they have been engaging in private discussions with each other. And what the Financial Times article said is that Iran 
has no real option but to respond in some way to the Israeli strike on their embassy in Damascus. Failing to do so would show weakness to Israel, might um, invite further attacks, and beyond that would lose Iran uh, credibility with some of its key allies in the Middle East, Hezbollah, the Houthis, whoever. So Iran had to respond. But what they said to the Americans through Oman is that we will respond, but we want to avoid a larger war. So if we do it, in a, if we slow walk it, if we do it in a kind of measured way, if we attack a few installations, but don't do a significant amount of damage, if we don't kill civilians and we don't kill military people, will you let the whole thing start to de-escalate from that point onwards? And that's what the Financial Times basically tells us the Iranians said to the Americans. And the Americans apparently said to the Iranians, we don't want to escalate the conflict either, provided you keep things at that kind of level. We too will work to try to de-escalate the situation from that point on. And that is exactly what we've seen. That is exactly how the situation has played out. So the Iranians launched a missile strike on Iran. Um, it did do a certain amount of damage. We'll come to that in a moment. Some missiles did get through. Um, it did demonstrate resolve. It was a, enabled the Iranians to tell their people and their allies in the Middle East uh, that, you know, we're not going to take Israeli attacks on us lying down. It told the Israelis as well, if you go on attacking us, well, we are in a position to defend ourselves. But at the same time, it was done at that kind of level where the Americans are able to say, well, right, let's call a stop. Let's draw a line under everything from this point on. We're not going to escalate beyond what has happened. And that's exactly what we see. So Biden telephones Netanyahu, tells him, you've achieved this amazing success. You've shot down all those Iranian missiles. You have suffered minimal damage. Um, let's let this pass. Let's move on. Let's not get into a situation of tit for tat. Let's try and avoid an escalation. And the very latest words that we heard last night and early this morning is that the Israelis who were planning an attack on Iran have now called it off. So things are playing out essentially in the same way that that Financial Artic Times article has told us. Uh, it, it is very strange. It is all, almost bizarre. But if you take a step back and think about what the interests of the two major sides, which are not Israel, but the United States and Iran, if you think about what their interests are, you can understand why it is playing out in the way that this, this is. Yeah, uh, I have a question for you. Uh, I also read that they called it off. I've also read I've read mixed reports, to be quite honest. I've read that they've called it off after the Biden phone call. I, I have read that uh, they had their war cabinet meeting in, in Israel and Netanyahu said that they're going to have to respond. They are going to retaliate. I heard reports saying they were going to retaliate last night. I've heard reports saying that they were going to retaliate at a day and time of their choosing. Uh, do you believe that that they're going to retaliate in some form or another some sometime in the in the near future? I mean, uh, and when I mean retaliation, it, it, it could mean a retaliation, a strike against Iran, or it could mean sanctions. I mean, it, it could it could be a broad range of of things. Do you believe that Netanyahu is going to have to do something in order to yeah. to please the the war cabinet? Because I have heard mixed reports about whether Israel's going to, to strike at Iran or not. And I've heard some reports saying they're going to strike hard at Iran. And I've heard a lot of reports saying they're going to work the sanctions route. What, what yeah. do you think? Right. Israel is, of course, the joker in the pack, because, of course, the Americans and the Iranians can agree all sorts of things with each other. Um, what the Israelis decide to do, we have seen that the Americans f have it, find it extremely difficult to control the Israelis. Um, and of course, always bear in mind that within the United States, in Washington, inside the administration itself, Israel has its advocates and its supporters and people who want Israel to go all the way 
and who want the United States to support Israel going all the way. And at times, and we've discussed this already, the president talks like he is one of those people. I mean, you know, he's talked about Israel having cast iron guarantees from the United States, all of those kind of things. So the Americans and the Iranians might come to an understanding with each other, but Israel is not a part of that understanding, and that has to be understood. Now, what the Israelis choose to do remains to be seen. The Americans have told the Israelis, we don't want you to retaliate, at least not in a kinetic way. The Americans have also convened the G7. Now, this isn't something that people have understood. They've asked, why is the United States calling up the G7 and not, say, NATO or something like that? The reason they're calling up the G7 is precisely because they do not want a military response. They want to bring together their core allies, in other words, the G7 states, the big ones, to put pressure on Israel, not to prepare for a war against Iran. That is their priority at the moment. So there are all those pressures building up on the Israelis from the American side. But the Israelis themselves are themselves under pressure. Netanyahu has set himself up. For many years now, as the tough prime minister who will take no nonsense, no threats from Iran, who's talked endlessly about the enormous danger that Iran poses to Israel. Very difficult to see him sitting back with folded hands after Israel, after Iran has launched military strikes against Israel. Beyond that, within his cabinet, he's got all kinds of other people. People like uh, Gantz, the defense minister, who is a rival, maybe a more moderate figure in some respects, maybe a more hardline figure in others. But he's probably sending that Netanyahu is now in an awkward position because he's between the Americans and, uh, um, you know, Israeli public. So Gantz can be the person who now strikes out and takes the hard line. And of course, there's other people within the cabinet who are much more hard line than Gantz. People like Ben Gvir and Smotrich. Ben Gvir has already threatened Netanyahu and told him that his prime premiership will be in jeopardy if he doesn't, if he really does call off the offensive on Rafa. So there are all these pressures within Iran, Israel. And I don't think the Israelis have made a final decision yet about what they're going to do. I think that some kind of response from Israel is inevitable. I mean, you know, it's all very well the Americans saying, you know, the Israelis mustn't do anything. I think politically within Israel, that is an impossible position to take, uh, at least for this uh, Israeli cabinet and for this Israeli prime minister. The question is, whether it will be a mild response or a response that is relatively mild and which the Iranians can live with and which will take us back to that you know, proxy war that we've had between Iran and Israel for a very long time where the Israelis do something covertly and the Iranians respond and tit for tat, things of that kind, or whether the Israelis do do something public and big, which the Iranians feel obliged to respond to. So this remains an extremely dangerous situation indeed. We're not out of it. I mean, we've not got through it at all. No one should think this. And, um, you know, there's going to be huge pressure on the Israeli government, both from the Americans and the G7 and others, no doubt. Um, but also um, counter pressure coming from its own supporters within Israel, large parts of the Israeli public from within the cabinet itself. And at the moment, it's difficult to know um, where this is going to go. Right. I, I agree. If if the response is mild from, from Israel, then we're off the escalation escalator. If it's not, then we're, we're back on it. And Iran's going to feel uh, obliged, obligated to. To retaliate and and yeah then then this thing you know gets out of hand, but um, you know do, do you feel like this could end if the Biden White House would just give out a stronger message 
with regards to to what Israel's going to do because you know the Biden White House is is very much engaged in in narrative control and I feel like right now they have the media running interference for them trying to get out the message that that uh, this was a, a success for Israel you shot down 99% of all the missiles this was a win for Israel this was a failure for Iran and you see a lot of articles from most of the the collective West media. Some of the neocon publications are calling for war. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> they always call for war, but uh, most of the uh, of the mainstream uh, media, New York Times, CNN, uh, Washington Post, uh, Wall Street Journal, they're pretty much running the the same uh, story, which is uh, Israeli defense is a success. U.S. Patriot uh, missiles are amazing. Uh, Iran failed in its retaliation. All is good, uh, but. But my opinion is that we're still missing a critical piece to, to, to getting off the escalation escalator, which is Biden, the president of the United States or the Biden White House. But the president, the president has to come out and say, this is over. This is over. It's done. Uh, Israel will not get any support from the United States if they go after Iran. If Israel finds itself in, in, in a mess by going after Iran, don't call us up. We're not going to be there for you. And and maybe he could even take it one step further and say, if Israel escalates, then you know, support's going to be going to be cut off. I mean, it's missing this strong statement from the United States to say it's over. This this whole affair is done. Let's move on. We're not you getting absolutely. that. You and we, and we never right. get it from the we Biden White House. It. We get narratives, we never get yeah. strong statements. Exactly. You're absolutely correct, because what they're trying to do is manipulate American, the American public by spinning narratives rather, like, rather than get complete control of the situation. We've discussed how complex the situation in, is, is in Israel, the enormous pressures on Netanyahu and on the cabinet and within the cabinet itself. Now, what this absolutely requires is exactly what you said, a strong statement from the administration, from the President of the United States, backed by statements from the Secretary of State, from Blinken, and from the Defense Secretary, Lloyd Austin, saying enough's enough, um, Israel's won, they've won this round, so, you know, there's no need for anything further, and we draw a line under the whole affair. And if the Israelis go forward, the United States opposes that. And they can say in private to the Israelis, if you do go forward, we'll do all the things that you talked about, you know, cut off aid, uh, uh, alert you in advance that you're on your own, do that sort of thing. But not only are they not doing that publicly, they're doing the opposite, even as all the indications are that in private, they're telling the Israelis to exercise restraint. And we're having, you know, cascade of articles now, briefings from anonymous officials telling us this. I'm sure this is true. Even as they're doing that in private, publicly, they're saying the exact opposite. They're saying, you know, we got Israel's back. Uh, we, you know, um, um, Israel will be defended no matter what. Um, you know, we have a cast iron, Israel has a cast iron support from the United States. So publicly, they give Israel a blank check, even as in private, they're trying to pull it back. Now, this is an impossible situation. And of course, it opens the way for Netanyahu to say to himself, well, at the end of the day, if I do launch a big attack on Iran, then I can do it. And the Americans will back me, even if at the moment they're saying that they won't. And even if they're unhappy, if I do it. So that's that is the fundamental problem. That is the ultimate failure of Israeli diplomacy or rather of U.S. diplomacy. And to be clear, the U.S. does have that power. It could do this. Um, it could assert itself authoritatively in the way that we've done. We said, but no sign it will do so, because, of course, the administration is itself divided. The president probably doesn't want to go there anyway, because viscerally, despite the fact that on this occasion, he does seem to understand 
some of the problems. But viscerally, his instinct is to support a hard line with Israel. And they're terrified that, you know, electorally in the election, taking a strong stand against Israel in this kind of way isn't going to play well. So the result is we get mixed messages, garbled messages. Um, it's fairly clear what the ascendant wing of the administration wants to see happen. But in the end, they can't translate it into straightforward words. So that massively increases the danger that this whole thing could go appallingly wrong. Yeah, and and from an election uh, standpoint, you also have guys like Sullivan, who I believe understand that if this thing does escalate, then th that's a whole nother part of of Biden's uh, base, let's say his base from 2020, that they would lose because there's a large part of the American public that would be absolutely opposed to uh, to an escalation in a war with Iran. And, and to be honest, uh, Israel is not ready for a conflict with Iran, nor is the United States ready for a conflict with Iran. And, and I believe there are people in the Netanyahu administration, but most importantly in the Biden White House, who understand that that this is yeah. a very, very bad idea. Absolutely. And I think that's perhaps where we must now segue and discuss briefly the actual strike itself, because, of course, you're quite right. There's been massive amounts of narrative construction around. There's a total failure. The missiles, half the missiles uh, collapsed at the moment when they were launched. Uh, they managed to shoot down 99 percent of them. A few got through, but did minimal damage and all of that. Now, the Iranians actually provided us with details of the targets that they were wanting to hit. And there were two bases, air bases, which they said were the bases from which the planes uh, uh, took off, which carried out the missile strike on their embassy in Damascus, and a building from which the, you know, the intelligence agencies, the Israeli intelligence agencies, were functioning. Now, from what I have been able to understand, the reality is that the Iranians managed to hit all three. Now, um, it, it's probably true that in terms of the basis, only a small amount of damage was done. But the fact is, Israel, with its enormously powerful and effective and dense air defense system, wasn't able to prevent some Iranian ballistic missiles getting through and hitting those bases. About the intelligence building, I'm not so sure, but I heard reports that it was one of the places that was also hit. So it wasn't the complete and utter failure that some people are saying. Some Iranian missiles did get through. I think what has confused a lot of people is that there was this huge number of drones and cruise missiles and rockets probably fired by Hezbollah. People are downplaying that, by the way, but it does seem as if that did happen. And rockets fired by the Houthis and other less sophisticated rockets fired by the Iranians themselves. Clearly, the purpose of that was to overwhelm the Israeli defenses. And in that, it was successful. It enabled, it opened the way for some missiles to get through. And by the way, one of the results is that it cost Israel an awful lot of money. I mean, the weapon systems that Israel expended over the course of one single night apparently had a value of something like $1.3 billion. That's, what, that's the figure that's been thrown, thrown around. Now, that suggests that in a long-term attrition war, where the Iranians are being more aggressive in attacking targets within Israel, Israel would be, I won't say defenseless, but in a vulnerable position. And of course, Israel has perhaps the densest air defense system in the world, but there are American bases scattered all across the Middle East. It does look as if Iranian missiles can get through. And if the United States is involved, well, its bases its personnel across the Middle East start to be vulnerable. Now, that's not saying that, you know, for the Iranians to do that, it's going to be cost-free for them. 
Um, obviously, we're talking about a missile and air war. They will be attacked themselves. They will take a lot of damage and they don't want to find themselves in that situation. But unlike Israel, Iran is a huge country. It is very mountainous country. It has places you can conceal all kinds of things. Probably all sorts of things have been concealed in all kinds of places. They can probably absorb levels of punishment that Israel and the United States cannot absorb in the Middle East. So over time, if we're talking about prolonged attrition war, they would probably come out on top. They don't want to go there. It would jeopardize their economic recovery. It would put a stress on their alliances. It might cause problems between them and the Saudis. But that's the reality of the overall military balance, which this attack has demonstrated. And as you absolutely rightly say, there are people in Washington who understand that. There are people in Israel who understand that too. The question is not whether there are people in Washington and Israel who understand the risks of this war. And I'm not even talking about, you know, what might happen, you know, elsewhere, whether other people in Iraq and Syria and Lebanon might get angry and might also decide to join the war in some way. So, that, you know, we get an absolute explosive fire across the Middle East. A distinct possibility, by the way. But there are people in Washington and Israel who understand the dangers, who understand that the United States is already overextended. It's got the war in Ukraine going on. It's short in missiles to supply to the Ukraine. It's got the problems with China and the South China Sea and over Taiwan. It's got oh, lots of other problems, problems in its economy, all those kind of things. There are those people who do understand that. The question is, are they being listened to? Are they being listened to in Washington? And are they being listened to in Israel? And if they are speaking out, is it nonetheless the case that there are people who nonetheless want to ignore what they're saying because they're so blinded by arrogance and confidence and belief in certain victory and are so intent on war, which is the only thing they seem to understand and seem to want well are those people prepared to listen to what these people these people who understand the situation are really saying we've seen time and again the councils of prudence and realism are disregarded <laughs> and with entirely predictable results that hasn't changed anything We've lurched from one disastrous adventure to another. You know, I'm not a gambling man, but if I was, I still wouldn't put money on the forces of reason prevailing in this situation. Yeah, I agree with you. That's what worries me is, um, you know, they, they always opt for war. But in this scenario, there must be some voices that are telling them, yeah, it, we, you want war? OK, um, I'm, I'm also for war. I'm sure there are voices that are saying, yes, I also want war. We've been wanting war with Iran for 30 years. But given the circumstances right now, we just can't do it. We just can't do it. And and we're going through an election. So everything, the timing is off. And, and I understand uh, John Bolton and I understand uh, uh, Mike Pompeo and all the neocons. I understand that you want this. But. You know, this is just not the right time. I mean, you know, that's that's kind of what I'm what I'm thinking might actually play out. Their yes, instinct is always for war, absolutely. I, but it, it's it's just not it's not there. It's not there I, at, at the moment, and it probably never will be. You know, to be quite honest, I think you know their their whole Iran war that that ship may have uh, may have sailed. And, and and before before you comment, uh, Iran has been very clear in their message. I just want to say they've been very clear. They've said it's over for us. We launched our attack. We got the results we wanted. We're done now. So their messaging has been crystal clear, very forward, very direct, very straight. For them, it's over. Yes, 
you're quite right. I mean, they're, they're crystal clear in what they're saying. Uh, the Americans, as we see, are not crystal clear. They're saying one thing to the Israelis in private. They're saying, well, not a completely different thing publicly. They're crowing about some great victory, which hasn't really happened. They're doing all of these, all of these things all the time. So you're absolutely right. Now, I think, like you, if, if you really push me, I think, like you, that those people who are, if you like, the soft neocons are the dominant neocons. They got the election. They're worried about the orange man. They're uh, uh, looking at the crisis in Ukraine. I think that in the end, they will prevail in this. They'll prevail in the United States and they will prevail in Israel. But, you know, the hard neocons, the ones who want war always, they're, they're also there. And, you know, they tend in the end to get what they want. So, again, I come back to what I'm saying. I think on balance that it will play out, as you say, and that this understanding that the Americans and the Iranians have reached with each other will, in the end, be fulfilled. But to repeat again, I wouldn't put money on it. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's you know, looking at the situation uh, realistically. And, you know, not these people aren't very realistic people. Um, they want war. I mean, you know, uh, Marco Rubio has already made some astonishing statements, you know, quoting from the Old Testament in a most terrifying way. And, you know, some of the articles that I've been reading have been, you know, from the hardline neocons have been shattering. So, you know, they are not going to be persuaded to give up on their demands for all out war. And um, there was another article I read, again, from Hardline Neocons. This is from National Review. Wasn't about Israel, by the way. It was about Ukraine. And they were analysing some of the articles that have recently been appearing, explaining the maths, explaining why victory in Ukraine is, uh, you know, impossible. And the National Review article said, you know, this is all surrender. The people who talk like this are surrenders. They're uh, chamberlains. They're people of that kind. They, you know, they, 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 uh, you know, they prepare to give up. You know, so I mean, you know, so and unfortunately, that kind of rhetoric does still have traction. But on balance, I agree. I think the overriding factor actually is the election. I think if it were not for the election we would probably be in a much worse position than the one we're in at the moment. Exactly. But, but, but because of the election, I think they will pull back. Yeah. The election and Trump standing there waiting. That, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I, would even, I would even say that the election, absolutely. And if it was a, say, say it was like a Nikki Haley, then I think they, they would actually go for it. It would actually the the hardcore neocons would would win out, but the fact that you have Trump there, I imagine there the, there are a lot of people that are that are like, look, we can't risk this this we cannot risk a war which will without a doubt sink Biden's reelection uh, chances. Absolutely, not not to mention the havoc it will do on international oil markets. <laughs> Inflation is already rising; it'll rise even further. Yeah, with the money. The aid package that Mike Johnson is preparing within the next few days to present to the House, um, maybe it's going to have Ukraine in there, maybe not. My guess is it's probably not going to have Ukraine, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, the, the, the main focus of the package, according to Johnson, is money to Israel. How, how is this part of the, the whole scenario? Maybe uh, Netanyahu is trying to create tension in order to to help the money along. Uh, maybe the money could be leveraged by the Biden White House in order to dissuade Netanyahu in Israel. I don't know. What, what, what are your thoughts on, yeah, it's a on very, the timing of the aid package? You know, this is a very, very good question because of course we don't, we don't quite know what the aid package is going to look like. But on the face of it, it's a sweetener. <laughs> it looks like a sweetener to me to get the Israelis to ha to stand down in the sense that um, they've just blown away $1.3 billion of, of you know, very expensive weaponry in a single night. Um, they've got a very difficult situation in Gaza. The um, Israeli economy has gone through a very, very rough patch. Um, all the young men have been conscripted. 
brought into the army, in fact, not just young men, all the reservists have been conscripted and brought into the army. There's um, a collapse in tourism, all of that sort of thing. So it's been in a bad way. So it's a good way for the US to get to get some leverage over the situation. They can say to Netanyahu and to the cabinet, look, we want you to slow down. If you slow down, well, in return for you slowing down, we're giving you X, X number of billion dollars. Um, and, you know, just, um, you know, listen to what we say. I mean, that's my own guess about this. Of course, it could be otherwise. It could be that, you know, the Israelis will take it as further proof that whatever they do, the Americans will still back them. I mean, you know, one, one mustn't discount that as well. We don't know what the exact amount is going to be. Um, we don't know whether there's going to be any strings attached, unlikely, uh, to be honest. But we'll just have to wait and see how it plays out. Again, it also, and it, it also relates to domestic American politics in that there's clearly a scramble between some politicians in the U.S., for you know, to, to show that they're loyal to Israel at this time, again, important at a time when the election is looming. So, you know, all of this is in play. Yeah, yeah, the timing of it is lines up that, that this is probably an important piece to the puzzle as far as uh, either de-escalation or escalation. Who knows? It could go either way. Yeah, with the money, yeah. All right, we will end it there. The Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, Bitch Shoots, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran shop, pick up some limited edition merch. The link is in the description box down below. Take care.